Let's turn now to 2020 because Democrats nationally are grappling with their party's unsettled presidential field. And Saturday's caucuses in Nevada could provide some clarity. Days after former New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg made his debut on the debate stage in Las Vegas, Bloomberg was under attack from the start. The mayor has to stand on his record. He has gotten some number of women, dozens, who knows, to sign non-disclosure agreements, both for sexual harassment and for gender discrimination in the workplace. So, Mr. Mayor, are you willing to release all of those women from those non-disclosure agreements so we can hear their side of the story? We have a grotesque and immoral distribution of wealth and income. Mike Bloomberg owns more wealth than the bottom 125 million Americans. That's wrong. That's immoral. We shouldn't have to choose between one candidate who wants to burn this party down and another candidate who wants to buy this party out. I can't think of a ways that would make it easier for Donald Trump to get reelected than listening to this conversation. Joining us from Las Vegas, where she has been reporting all week, is Laura Barone Lopez, national political reporter for Politico. Laura, thanks so much for being here. Appreciate thanks it. Thanks for having me. I know you could be doing other things on Friday night in Las Vegas, so to be on Washington Week, it means a lot. What does it tell you that Michael Bloomberg on Friday decided to now release women who have non-disclosure agreements with him to now speak up publicly if they choose to do so? Well, it, it shows that this pressure that mounted on him from earlier this week, starting uh, before the debate, actually, because Elizabeth Warren had called for him to release women from those NDAs even prior to the debate, slightly telecasting uh, that, that she may bring that up, and she indeed did, uh, repeatedly standing side by side uh, with him on that debate stage. Uh, former Vice President Joe Biden, also earlier today, added to that pressure. Um, so it shows that Bloomberg is getting more and more scrutiny now that he is considered in the, the top tier of candidates, even though no votes have been cast for him, uh, simply because he is spending an exorbitant amount of money in the Super Tuesday states, and a number of campaigns see him as a serious threat in those states. Laura, you've been doing a lot of reporting on the ground in Nevada. Latino voters in that state, the union worker, is Senator Sanders, who's now leading in national polls and rising in national polls, poised to win there in the caucuses? Uh, yes. Um, the entire sense on the ground is that Sanders is far and away the leading candidate in Nevada and that he has strong support among Latino voters. The question is how many turn out in a caucus, because a caucus is uh, far more detailed and takes up a lot more time than just going to cast your ballot uh, in a typical primary. So it, it'll be important to watch those numbers to see how many actually turn out and how many turn out for Sanders. He has spent, uh, his campaign says that they've spent millions uh, on Latino outreach alone in Nevada. They are also spending a lot in states like California and in Texas to turn out Latinos. Uh, the, the race for second is really the big deal here. Who is going to get that slot? And Joe Biden's campaign is projecting that he'll get it. But I was just talking to a Nevada Democrat who was well, who's well connected, who said uh, not to sleep on Pete Buttigieg because he appears to be really uh, hitting the pavement in the rural parts of the state. And that could prove pivotal for him. Shannon, what about, stay with us, Laura, but what about Senator Warren? She took on Mayor Bloomberg. Is it too late for a revival? Well, I don't think it's it's necessarily too late for anybody. It'll be too late in about two weeks. But you know, she certainly has, uh, you know, could could carve out a second lane for herself. But you know, the Bernie Sanders uh, coalition wing or whatever seems to be really solidifying uh, behind him. And of course, you know, that's so much where uh, her support was coming from. As people had questions about Sanders, they went over and gave Warren another look. Um, and as we've seen the Biden supporters drop off, they have not gone to her. They, you know, you can see them going to Sanders. They're going to Bloomberg. So. I'm not sure where she really picks up uh, support. And I think in that last debate, uh, the takeaway, at least the, the takeaway I heard from a lot of people, is that she was more like an attack heat-seeking missile rather than doing any favors for herself and, and building herself up too much as a candidate. But we'll see. I mean, anything can happen at this point. Bloomberg, you've covered City Hall in New York. Can he come back from this? 
Uh, well, he's got to have a better performance in the next debate, that's for certain. I think uh, his performance, even his advisors were taken aback by uh, how poorly he performed. I think in the second, yes, he can, I mean, he could come back, but I think he has to have a strong debate performance. Although, you know, the money goes a long way. He certainly looks, he looks very good in his ads, you know. Uh, there's, but there's a difference when he gets on stage. I think that, um, I think he was better in the second part of the debate. He was more uh, like himself but when, when he was asked, should you have made all that money? I think it was a good answer, yes. You know, what was he supposed to say? No, I feel bad about that. And I think if you're an ordinary American watching, you would think that seems to be the right answer. What's the White House's view of Senator Sanders and his ascendancy? They want to run against him. Really? Yeah, they do. There are some people who have a view of, you know, be careful what you wish for. Um, and I've heard that line a few times from people in there just because it's such a divided country. An Bernie's outsider got, versus an outsider. Right. He's got, Sanders versus he's, Trump. He's got real energy behind him and he can appeal to some of the same voters as Trump. But the, the predominant view that I find talking to people in the campaign and in the White House is they want to label whoever they run against as a socialist. They're going to do it anyway. They, if, if, if Joe Biden happened to be the nominee, they would call him a socialist. I've been told that. But Bernie calls himself a socialist. So it actually makes it much easier to do that. And they want to make the campaign capitalism versus socialism and go to these women in the suburbs who the Democrats managed to win over in 2018 and go back to them and say, you really want to risk it on Bernie Sanders? And then is when the money starts piling in and they start to try and win back the House, go but down ticket. I do think that careful what you wish for, though, is real with Sanders. And I think they see more strength in Sanders than they do in other candidates, though, as well. Like, while they may see his policies as completely toxic and unappealing to most Americans, at least that's their, the Trump campaign's assessment, they see him as authentic. He has a likability factor. He has a loyal base that will stick with him, even if he has a heart attack. Um, and those are Trump's strengths, and they see those in Sanders. So I think he is a, still a little bit of a wild card, and he could reshape the map in some ways that they're not used to putting places like, for example, like Texas in place.